I've got a different microphone on. I've got a different microphone on. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm delighted to be here as well. I'd like to thank Joe and the organisers for inviting me. Um, so I'm very happy to, take, to be interrupted and for people to ask questions as we go through. This, by kind of definition, does have medical terminology and you know, the management of MEN1 can be quite complex. So what I really hope to do is try and keep it as simple as possible, but I apologise in advance if there are things that uh, need clarification. So please do interrupt and stop, at any, stop me at any point. So what I'd like to do is just to kind of give the headlines, really, from the uh, most recently published guidelines for the management of MEN1, which were published last year. And these, the senior authors on these were Raj Thacker and uh, Maria Luisa Brandi from Italy. And so what's the purpose of having guidelines for the management of MEN1? Well, I think there are a number of different reasons why guidelines are important. Firstly, I think it increases the awareness of MEN1. It provides a framework for clinicians on which to base care. And to some extent, although these are guidelines and they're not a rigid protocol, they do provide uh, some degree of standardisation between institutions. I think they're also useful because in putting the guidelines together, they outline areas of controversy and also identify areas where we don't know what the best course of action is. Um, and I think also by providing guidelines, it also provides not just the management of uh, an individual with MEN1, but also considers the wider implications within uh, the larger family. And the ultimate goal really has to be to try and improve the outcome for individuals with MEN1. So these are the guidelines, as I say, that we published last year. And I think another thing to say is that they are, um, they've been put together by an international field. And that comes with um, a number of issues, not least that we are dealing with uh, management styles that come from different um, parts of the world, and there may not always be agreement between what we do in the UK and what we do in the States and what we do in Europe. So this is a consensus between the interna amongst international leaders within the field of MEN1. So as I said, these update the previous guidelines published in 2001. As I've said, they represent the views of international leaders within the field of multiple endocrine neoplasia. And the way in which we put the guidelines together was to try and undertake a systematic review of the literature. And when I go through, uh, when we're putting the recommendations together, the recommendations come with some kind of clarification. So to say, how strong a guideline should this be? Or how strong a recommendation should this be? And... So some of the guidelines, are, uh, they're all put together using a, a system of grading called the grade system. And this allocates recommendations based on whether they're a strong or a weak guideline. And a strong, guide, a strong recommendation, we feel that patients are likely to benefit if they follow that recommendation or clinicians follow that recommendation. A weak guideline, the evidence for that, uh, the likely benefit is less clear cut. And so although it is the balance of opinion that we recommend this, I think those recommendations do require more cautious interpretation. And then for each of those recommendations, we've assigned a degree of a quality of evidence supporting those recommendations. And what that means is when we look at the scientific literature, what is the evidence to support what we say? And as I'll come on to, there is a problem here. Because what we know is that to date, there have been very few randomised clinical studies of patient care or of treatment options in multiple endocrine neoplasia. And the reason for that is because it's a rare disorder. And therefore, for most of the recommendations, there is not clear-cut um, evidence-based uh, medicine based on large uh, clinical trials. Rather, it's based on case reports or case control studies or smaller studies of series of patients on which we're basing the recommendations. So something has gone wrong with this slide. Um, so this is the really the point that I was making to say that there is a lack of evidence from clinical trials that specifically evaluate um, the treatment methods, the diagnosis and screening of MEM1 associated tumours. And therefore their recommendations are largely based on the balance of expert opinion. And the other critical point is that these are not meant to be 
a rigid protocol for people to follow. What they are is a guideline for people to, to, to use as a template, if you like, for considering what the best treatment options are and also to provide the supporting evidence for why uh, you might follow these particular recommendations. Um, I'm just going to see if this continues. Um, so if we come on to MEM1, there are three ways we can make a diagnosis of uh, MEM1. You can have a clinical diagnosis of MEM1, and that would be an individual who has two MEM1-associated tumours. It doesn't say anything about the genetic etiology, it's just purely two clinical manifestations, so a pituitary tumour, a parathyroid tumour, and a pancreatic or uh, neuroendocrine <coughs> tumour. And that would constitute a clinical diagnosis. You could have a familial diagnosis. So this would be a patient who is a relative of someone who's known to have MEM1, who has the first presentation, the first, uh, who develops the first tumour. And again, this doesn't say anything about the genetic basis of it. It would be a familial diagnosis of MEM1. And finally, you could have a situation where someone is known to carry an MEM1 mutation, but has developed no manifestations. And that could be considered a genetic diagnosis of MEM1. And I think it's just worth considering those three diagnoses because, um, as you will know, it's um, how individuals within each one of those group may be managed slightly differently. So I'm going to start off just by, I know you've had some talks on genetic testing and implications of genetic testing earlier in the day, but this is the guidelines, that uh, the recommendations that we've made on uh, genetic testing in the, the most recent guidelines. So what we suggest is doing the DNA mutation analysis of the MEM1 gene should be offered to all patients with a clinical diagnosis of MEM1, and if they are a mutation carrier, to their first degree relatives. And this includes relatives who either are asymptomatic or already have manifestations. In addition, we should offer MEM1 mutation analysis to asympto asymptomatic relatives um, at the earliest opportunity, ideally prior to the onset of any biochemical or radiological screening. And we recommend that the earlier this uh, genetic testing is done, the better. And the reason we make that recommendation is that we know that the earliest manifestations of MEM1-associated tumours can occur in early childhood, so as young as five years of age. And so although we don't feel there is a right or wrong answer to what age genetic testing should be done, it's a personal choice to be discussed with the families and parents, we recommend that it certainly should be considered at the earliest opportunity. And then um, we also recognise in the guidelines that we think that anyone having MEM1 genetic testing this should be accompanied by genetic counselling at the same time to understand what the implications of both a positive and negative result would be. And for those in whom an MEM1 mutation is identified, then at that point they should enter a period of um, uh, biochemical and radiological screening for the development of, for, to uh, investigate for the development of MEM1 associated tumours. Do those, do they raise any questions with anyone at this stage? Yeah. Do you recommend within a family, if for instance, say the five-year-old and the younger sibling, do you recommend the testing to occur at the same time um, so that the family are sort of going through the same thing together? Or do you get the first one tested at five, wait a bit longer to get I, I don't think I don't have a strong feeling. I think this has to be a personal choice to be discussed with the, the parents. Some may find it, e you know, I don't think there is a way that we, you know, I think you just discuss what the implications of doing uh, both children together would be, or to discuss doing them separately. And I think there isn't a right answer to that. I think all we're saying in this guide, in this recommendation, is that we think there is some benefit to doing it early. So at that point, that certainly some biochemical screening could start at a, a young age. So that if we move on, moving on from the genetic testing to the screening for tumours, um, so what we recommend is that all individuals identified as having a high risk of developing MEM1-associated tumours 
should be offered program, a combined program of biochemical and radiological screening. But the nature and the timing of this screening will depend both on local resources, clinical judgment, and patient preference. And the reason you can see the grading for that is two is weak, <coughs> and the evidence is weak. And the reason for that is, you know, there have been no trials to date to tell us whether screening actually changes the outcome. We all assume that it does and that it's a good thing to do, but there isn't the evidence to support that screening um, has been shown to be beneficial. But I think all of us who look after patients with MEM1 feel that this is a critical part of the management. And when I say high risk of developing MEM1-associated tumours, that would include people who are mutation carriers and also those who may not be mutation carriers but have got a clinical diagnosis of MEM1 because we know a proportion of people with clinical MEM1 will not carry the M a mutation within the MEM1 gene that we can identify. So it's not simply those who carry an MEM1 mutation. And then if I'm just going to briefly touch on each of the kind of headlines for uh, what our recommendations are for each of the tumours um, that constitute MEM1. So we're talking about parathyroid tumours, the pancreatic and pituitary tumours, and then briefly on the thymic and bronchial carcinoid tumours, as well as adrenal adenomas. And I think this is perhaps the most important um, message that I think the guidelines recommend, is that for patients with multiple endocrine neoplasia um, and their families should be managed by a team that have expertise in managing the condition. And this should um, consist of relevant specialists with the management of each of the components of the, uh, of the syndrome. And that ideally, as and when MEM1 associated tumours develop, that those tumours should be discussed as part of a multidisciplinary team, which will not only include endocrinologists, uh, endocrine surgeons, it should include gastroenterologists, oncologists, histopathologists and radiologists, as well as the clinical geneticists. So what we're promoting is that a very wide spectrum of medical specialties are involved in the management of the, the tumours associated with MEM1. There is no clinical, it is difficult to give something a strong recommendation based on no evidence at all. So what we think we can do, with all these grading recommendations are, are they provide some information about what the background to the recommendation is. So I don't think any of us would say we don't particularly recommend this, but it is difficult to make a strong recommendation without any evidence at all. And we would never be in a position to do a trial to compare looking after patients with an MDT compared to looking after patients without an MDT because we feel so strongly that we should be managing them with an MDT. Well, I think that would, there probably is some evidence out there you know, anecdotally, but the evidence that we are looking for on which you can base recommendations to give a strong, you know, to give a, a high level of evidence would have to be a, a randomised control trial. To get a medium, so, you know, medium evidence base has to be a case control trial, so you have cases and controls. So all of this is going to be is anecdotal saying we've had patients referred to our clinic who've been managed locally, perhaps not by the optimum specialty, and they didn't necessarily get the optimum operation or treatment. But that doesn't form an evidence base. And this is by no means, as I said, a rigid recommendation, but this is what we have put together as being an example screening strategy for um, the parathyroid, pancreatic, pituitary, adrenal, and uh, carcinoid tumours. And so for parathyroid tumours, we're recommending that we don't need any routine imaging, but it would be an annual blood test to measure the calcium level in the blood and the parathyroid hormone. That for, um, for some of the pancreatic tumours, it can be based purely on biochemical testing, on blood tests. But for non-functioning pancreatic tumours and for other types of pancreatic tumour, it requires some imaging modality. And what we recommend in these guidelines is 
some form of annual imaging, although that is controversial, as you know, some people would argue that because you haven't shown there's a benefit, there is a no clear-cut benefit to doing annual screening, that perhaps that imaging shouldn't be on an annual basis, it should be less frequent. And uh, for pituitary tumours, again, the most common form of screening would be blood tests, but imaging, uh, we recommend imaging on every kind of three <coughs> to five yearly basis as routine. And then the adrenal kind of gets covered by the pancreatic imaging normally, because when you look for pancreatic tumours, almost always you will get some information about the adrenal glands at the same time. And looking for thymic and bronchial carcinoids, I think this is probably one of the recommendations we make where probably the, the, that imaging does not form necessarily a part of routine care in all centres at the moment, I would say. But that is a, a kind of outline or a template for an example of a screening strategy that um, might be adopted. So if we move, start off with parathyroid tumours. So this is one in which we can give a strong recommendation to say that patients should have an annual measurement of calcium and parathyroid hormone. There's the, the diagnos diagnosis of primary hyperparathyroidism in MEM1 is relatively easy to make. And then in terms of treatment, this is where it becomes more difficult because at the moment, um, although uh, the type of operation, uh, there is general consensus that doing minimally invasive parathyroid surgery, which by that I mean taking one gland away, is not recommended because typically in MEM1, several of the glands are involved. However, the difficulty is that the optimum timing of surgery hasn't been defined. And so... Um, what we recommend is that we do an open neck exploration where at least three and a half of the glands are uh, removed or to undertake total parathyroidectomy in which case all glands are removed and that may or may not be supplemented with autotransplantation which is done in, uh, frequently done in Europe and in some parts of the States. Do those recommendations make, do they make sense? But it wouldn't, I think we would, I think we would, you know, the indications for surgery and uh, parathyroid, with parathyroid disease, we will be looking for evidence that there is end organ damage as a result of the overactive parathyroid. So by looking for the evidence of, you know, high levels of calcium in the urine, whether there's been renal stones, whether there's evidence of osteoporosis, whether there are other symptoms associated <coughs> with the high calcium, or whether the, the degree of hypercalcemia is worrying, but I don't think in, in um, MEM1 often, so the, the glands can be affected at different times and are often become, all four glands can become en enlarged and we haven't established a clear, so if there was a clear indication for surgery, then surgery should be performed, but if there isn't, we know it's not going to go away and it occurs at a young age, therefore it isn't always clear what the best time for surgery would be. Well, I think that becomes a discussion as to, you know, when you know that the, the problem isn't going to go away, then to some extent there may be some argument for getting on and going down a surgical route, but then there is morbidity associated with the, the, sur the surgery, and even undertaking the surgery, there is still a, a possibility of recurrence following surgery. So these guidelines by no means have all the answers, and what I don't want to do is give a you know, this isn't necessarily about my point, uh, kind of my point of view, but, um, yes? Um, with uh, transplant, is that a, possible, a possibility after all the glands have been removed in the past, or do they do that at the same time? They would do it at the same time. So you wouldn't be able to have that done uh, retrospectively? <laughs> no. Right, okay. So the autotransplant is based on taking parathyroid, viable cells from the parathyroid gland at the same time of surgery. Sometimes they can be cryopreserved and put back in at a later point, or they're put in kind of simultaneously. But um, if the glands have been taken away, you know, the options for retrospective um, uh, implantation have been missed. I, I, I yeah. thought maybe there was a chance that somebody else could donate theirs. I don't think that's... Um,
The autotransplantation is very popular outside of the UK, I think, but I mean, certainly in Oxford, we don't recommend it. Um, I mean, clearly, if you're putting the same tissue back in, there is still a likelihood, A, there's no guarantee that it will work because you're putting the tissue, you're doing an operation, you're handling the parathyroid tissue and you're putting it somewhere where whether it works or not at that point, uh, you don't know. If it does work, the possibility is that it's the same tissue there, so it could still be affected by uh, developing the high calcium again in the future, in which case then you need to take it out. So I would say that typically in the United Kingdom, we don't routinely do autotransplantation, but certainly there are people who are very keen advocates on the author guide or on the authors of these guidelines, and that's why, and certainly in, in Europe, it's done, and certain parts of the States, it's done. We have had one patient where they, it was difficult to find it in the forearm, basically, which is these whole issues. And uh, that's been stopped. <coughs> okay. So the screening for pituitary tumours, I think, is probably the most straightforward, in that many of the, the most common types of pituitary tumour in MEM1 are prolactinomas, which can be identified by a raised prolactin level in the blood or uh, acromegaly or the secretion of too much um, growth hormone from the pituitary, which can be detected by uh, or screened for by a single blood test. However, because we know that some tumours within the pituitary can be non-functioning or non-secretory, then we do recommend doing imaging every three to five years to look at the shape of the pituitary gland, or sooner if there are any symptoms to suggest there is a pituitary tumour there. And the treatment of MEM1-associated pituitary tumours is exactly the same as that of those with uh, sporadic pituitary tumours, in that if it's a prolactinoma, then that would typically be tablet treatment. If it's um, acromegaly or growth hormone-producing tumour, it might be a combination of um, medication and or surgery. And if it's other forms of uh, tumour which reach a particular size or are problematic, then uh, pituitary surgery and or radiotherapy would be the treatments of choice. So I think by far the most difficult area for the management of MEM1 is for screening and treatment of pancreatic or um, the kind of neuroendocrine tumours associated with MEM1. Um, so we feel that screening for gastropancreatic nects should include as a minimum an annual plasma biochemical evaluation of the gastrointestinal uh, hormone profile, including a measurement of gastrin, glucagon, the VIP pancreatic polypeptide, chromogranin A with insulin and fasting glucose levels. Um, and a consensus for the optimum, optimum radiological screening uh, program has not been identified, but we feel some form of annual imaging should be undertaken. The most sensitive screening modality to detect any abnormalities within the pancreas or duodenum is probably endoscopic ultrasound, although the provision of this on a local basis to the, uh, you know, is quite significant. Yeah, it's, it would be a service that would be quite difficult to provide on an annual basis. Um, we favour magnetic resonance imaging at the moment as the, uh, to avoid the exposure to frequent doses of ionising radiation. So in terms of the treatment of pancreatic tu uh, tumours, I mean, I think the ultimate goal is that, so the main aim is to maintain patients' disease and symptom-free for as long as possible and to maintain a good quality of life. I mean, that uh, goes without saying. And the treatment for those with functioning pancreatic tumours, including insulinomas, would be curative surgery um, where possible. But prior to doing any form of surgery or intervention, it's important that the extent, uh, there is a, a thorough evaluation of the extent of the disease. The treatment of gastrinomas is controversial. Um, and I think that's probably the most important uh, message is that we don't have a right answer for this. So where one area where it is quite clear is in the rare occasion where gastrinomas occur within the pancreas and reach a certain size which, um, you know, if they're a well-defined gastrinoma within the pancreas, we feel that surgical uh, treatment 
should be the treatment of choice. But in MEM1, the majority of patients with gastronoma, these are multiple, they're small, they may be microscopic, and they tend to occur within the duodenum rather than the pancreas. In the UK, we have tended to favour medi medical management, and this has been based on the, with, so with tablet treatment, proton pump inhibitors, uh, this is based on the previous surgical series show that in MEM1 patients, if you undertake surgery, you rarely cured the problem. However, there is more recent uh, evidence that suggests doing extensive surgical procedures by very specialized centers may uh, provide a curative, um, a, a curative tr uh, approach to these tumors. But we feel at the moment the evidence for that, so the strength of that recommendation is weak and the evidence for that is not clear cut. But people have recently reported uh, curative approaches to um, Gastro, uh, uh, duodenal gastronomas. And then an area that again is difficult is one of the most common groups of tumours in MEM1, non-functioning pancreatic tumours. And these are important because in the largest series this is now one of the leading causes of death in MEM1. And so in the past it was associ typically associated with gastronomas which were untreated leading to peptic ulceration and hemorrhage. But with the advent of medical treatment, people uh, are typically identified at a, an earlier time point and are treated effectively. And so one of the, the most difficult tumours to deal with now is the non-functioning pancreatic tumours. And again, the optimum management of these tumours is uh, not well defined. However, we recommend considering surgery, and we're not saying undertaking, we're saying considering surgery for any tumour that's more than one centimetre in size and or demonstrates significant growth over six to 12 months. Other groups would typically use two centimetres as the cutoff. And the reason for this recommendation is in the series of patients where they've looked, there seems to be a correlation between the size of the pancreatic tumour and its ability to spread elsewhere. So that the bigger it is, the more likely it is to spread elsewhere. And certainly above four centimetres, well, between two and four centimetres, the risk of it move, uh, having spreading elsewhere is increased. Below two centimetres it isn't clear, and less than one centimetre, the risks seem quite low. However, there are other studies where that correlation hasn't been identified, and therefore I think our guideline is quite cautious in that we are saying consider surgery really for any tumour that's greater than one centimetre or one that is showing a change over a relatively short period of time. Um, we've included in this the importance of having uh, pathologists, so the people who look at the down the microscope at the tumours, to be able to grade the tumours appropriately. And for those in whom surgery isn't appropriate, then there are other therapeutic options, including somatostatin analogues, uh, biotherapy, uh, forms of uh, radio label treatments, or in chemotherapy. And for those patients where there is metastatic disease or where there's advanced disease, then typically chemotherapy uh, is used uh, and the use of newer agents such as uh, drugs called mTOR or tyrosine kinase inhibitors may be effective for individuals with advanced disease. Adrenal tumors haven't typically formed a large part of the kind of recommendations in the past, we were aware of a high prevalence of people with adrenal tumours in MEM1. And therefore we recommend a kind of a minimum, minimum screening protocol of a looking at the adrenal glands up to um, every three years, and that if there are <coughs> abnormalities there, that they should remain under radiological surveillance and should be assessed for any features which suggest they may, may behave in a malignant fashion and that biochemical evaluation, so this is looking for adrenal tumours that are secreting too much hormone that may be associated with high blood pressure or too much steroid production, should be, um, should be focused on those with uh, tumours greater than a centimetre in size. And the treatment of these is similar to those uh, individuals who have uh, sporadic or non-MEM1 associated adrenal tumours, and surgery is indicated either for those that are producing too much hormone where there will be a cure to that hormone excess by surgery or for those 
that um, have any form of atypical features or are greater than four centimeters in size. Or we've qualified that by saying or that show a, a change over a six month, uh, a significant change over a six month period. And finally, focusing on bronchial and thymic carcinoid tumors. Bronchial carcinoid tumors um, in European populations tend to occur more frequently in women, whereas thymic carcinoids occur more frequently in men. That isn't the same all throughout the world. For example, in Japan, thymic carcinoids have an equal sex distribution there. So we don't differentiate by sex in these guidelines. And here we recommend imaging of the, the chest, so by that I mean the lungs, every one to two years for the detection of these tumors. And that here the treatment of choice would be curative surgery where possible if the, the tumor was localized to a, a single area. If it's spread elsewhere, then additional therapies may include radiotherapy and chemotherapy. So this is a kind of an overview, which I don't know whether it may just be worth just walking through, just kind of an over, it's kind of a summary slide of what we've said. So if we make a clinical diagnosis of MEM1, if we start at the top, if there's a clinical diagnosis of MEM1, so an individual with two or more MEM1 associated tumours, we think the first thing to do is test for an MEM1 mutation. If an MEM1 mutation is identified, then we should be doing, thinking about two things. The first is to going into a program of biochemical and radiological screening, and the second is to be thinking about the rest of the family. So identifying first degree relatives, so this is an individual with a known MEM1 mutation in whom we can screen family mem members for that mutation. And for those family members who don't have a mutation, then clearly at that point no further investigation is required. For those who do have mutations, then they will come back now into the uh, screening protocol as per their relative. If an MEM1 mutation isn't identified, then this raises a number of possibilities. So this could be the 10% of in individuals in whom we don't find an MEM1 mutation. It could be due to the presence of uh, mutations with other genes that we do know about, uh, depending on the clinical situation, and therefore we will consider doing mutation analys analysis of other genes known to be associated with tumors that can occur in MEM1. But for those with a clinical diagnosis of MEM1, in whom we don't identify a mutation, then we could still consider a form of limited surveillance um, depending on whether or not they have the, the extent of their clinical features. And in addition, we should still be identifying first degree relatives of those individuals and offer some form of biochemical and radiological screening, knowing that they will not, you know, that they're not going to have the MEM1 mutation. So, for those, so once we've entered the screening program here, if all, everything looks normal on the annual screening, then we simply go into an, uh, a, a standard follow-up with biochemical or radiological screening, typically on an annual basis. If there is any abnormal result, this will prompt the need for further treatment or investigations at that point. So in summary, I think the key messages are really that the optimum management of MEM1 uh, associated tumors isn't clearly defined for each of the tumor types. The key message is that individuals with MEM1 should be being managed by a multidisciplinary team consisting of individuals with uh, expertise in the management of the tumors arising in MEM1. And that these guidelines simply provide a framework uh, for providing patient care uh, but the exact detail of what is provided locally will depend on uh, local resources, patient preference, um, and these are going to inform the kind of decision-making process. And I think that's it. So thank you very much.